we're just so honored to have him here again and uh, thankful to call him a friend and part of the family here. So God bless you. Amen. Is there any other ministers that are here? I just want to honor you. All right. They're probably in their own churches preaching this Sunday. So anyways. All right. Well, it's a, it's a real honor to have Bobby here. Um, it's been a blessing to get to know him and his wife over the years. And uh, they walk in integrity. They have a sure word from the Lord. The Bible talks about a clear trumpet. I've seen him through the years prophesy things, and those things happen. One of the first times he came here, the, he was ministering all the way up here in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. He used, God uses him in big churches all over the world. God told him to come here. He was up here ministering. And he went into a vision, and I remember he said, I see it. It's like a mineral in the ground. He said, they're going to discover a mineral in the ground here, and it's going to bring in many high-paying jobs. And um, about six months after that, you, in fact, he said, this county is going to strike gold. It's going to be a mineral. After that, in Barron County, there it is in the newspaper, Barron County strikes gold, frack sand. So I sent that down to him, and that was kind of fun. But I've seen God use him to, to, uh, to bring people to Jesus and to help churches come back into life in alignment with God. So we're just so honored to have him here. Would you stand and welcome him as he comes? Are we on yet? Good. God bless you. Well, glad to, glad to be here. I really mean that. Have a seat. Boy, what a wonderful God we serve. Isn't that amazing that he, he knows every bad thing we've ever done and still loves us? Now, that's amazing, isn't it? The Bible said he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I'm telling you, the Bible said he's a very present help. In the time of trouble. The Bible says we can cast all of our care upon him. Because he cares for us. He gives us an invitation. He said come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me for I'm meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. I'll tell you now. This is what the Lord told me. He said you look at my people and say to them. You cannot meditate. You cannot medicate anxiety. You have to repent of it. You can't go get a pill. You have to repent. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. But with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. You can't medicate anxiety. You have to repent of it. And God doesn't want you to be anxious. No, God's in control. He just wants you to settle down and start trusting him. You can rely upon him. Nahum 1, 7. Say it, Nahum Chapter 1, verse 7. I preached a message about Nahum. So they built the road where uh, our homes are at, Nahum Road. So anyway, Nahum chapter 1, verse 7 says, God is good. Didn't say he was good or he's going to be good. He is good. Right in the middle of your mess, he's good. God is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those that are trusting him. I want you to learn how to trust the Lord. The word trust means casting. Just putting the whole weight of what's, what's on you on him. He's able to bear it, isn't he? He is our burden barrier, isn't he? He'll not put more on us than we're able to bear. God is good. Say it. God is good. Oh, say it again. God, God is, good. is good. We ought to go around the whole world telling people, God is good. Listen, the devil's bad. The devil wants to kill you. If he could, he'd kill every one of us in this room today. But the Bible said he can't harm a hair of our head. No weapon formed against us will prosper. Uh, I'm telling you, the devil's shooting blanks like Barney Five had a pistol but no bullet. <laughs> you understand that? No weapon formed against us will prosper. So I'm, I, I've enjoyed being here. Oh, we're busy. We, for for uh, uh, f over 54 years, I've averaged speaking five times a week for 54 years. I'm living proof practice won't make perfect. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's absolutely true. For 54 years, I've averaged speaking five times a week. And I'm telling you what, 
God wants us to share and shine and get into the Word of God. Let the Word of God get into us. It'll be very, very beneficial. So uh, I've got books we'll be talking about after a while. But anyway, uh, one of the things I want to do, I, I, we're going to do, the Lord willing, we're going to pray for the pastors. We're going to pray for uh, Pastor Bob and Char. I'm telling you, and this is going to be a new commission for you. It's in the Bible. It says uh, you'll, be, you'll be able to fully follow the prophetic endowment that's going to come on you. You want to see it in the Bible? Yes, Bobby, I'd like to. Here it is. All right, I like to ask the questions. That way I get to answer them. Hey, look out now. I, I, I'm in the book of Timothy. Uh, look, look what it says. It says, uh, till I come, devote yourselves to... Uh, Publicly and privately to reading and exhorting yourselves in the teaching of the word of God. Do, verse 14, do not neglect the gift which is in you, that special inward endowment which was directly imparted to you by the Spirit of God, by the prophetic utterance when the elders laid their hands upon you. I'm telling you, this is going to be a change in your whole ministry. There's going to be a, a, a redirection. And I'm telling you, uh, God never redirects if he doesn't put us in a more fruitful field. You understand what I'm saying? He, 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 he says, all hands on deck. He wants us to make us sharp threshing instruments with teeth. That's in the Bible. And so there, there's going to be a coming now. And uh, it's going to be, uh, God always moves us up. He never has put us back. He's, his desire is us to, from, to go from glory to glory. Psalms 84, 11. He said, he'll be a son and a shield to us. No good thing will he withhold from those that are walking upright. He'll give us what? Present day favor, future glory, honor, splendor, and heavenly bliss. God moves us up, not out. You understand that? So this is, this is a, a step up. And I'm telling you, God, God said your name, the, God wants you to be a world changer. And he wants you to start planting more churches. You say, oh, no, no, it'll be easy. God will be behind it. There'll be the wind of the Holy Ghost on it. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to be, uh, spend a lot of time in third world countries where they need to hear the gospel. Our, our country needs to hear the gospel, but they're not quite ready yet. There are some countries hungry for God, desperate for God. And I'll tell you what, uh, so get ready. You, you, I want you... Uh, that are in this fellowship, I want you to stretch your hands towards your pastors and you're com God says you are commanded to pray for those that are in leadership, especially those that have the watch care over your souls. Uh, don't, go, don't sin against your pastors by not praying for them, okay? So you guys come here. All right. You say, well, you commissioned to do this? Absolutely. I'm absolutely commissioned by Almighty God to lay my hands on this couple and impart to them a bright new future. Uh, you know what the devil wants to do? Where is that? Oh, you know, I thought I could. I'm just exhausted. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as of eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. And I'll tell you what, there's going to come a fresh wind and a fresh fire. God's going to light things up. And I listen, look at the fruit you already have. But he's going to move us from one dimension of glory to the next. He never wants us to stagnate. This is an this is a, this is a upgrade. Say upgrade. upgrade. I always like upgrades. Um, so you all going to get an upgrade. You ready? Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for this opportunity to lay my hands upon this precious couple. Thank you that you've captured their heart, their lives for the kingdom of God. I pray for our fresh new fire. I pray for the oil of the Holy Ghost. Saturation. Saturate us, God. And then, Lord, throw in the torches. Lord, let your works appear. And I thank you for this. Now, I pray you'll bless the works of their hands and their hearts. I pray for great fruit, Lord. I'm asking you right now, make crooked ways straight. Lower the mountains. Fill in the valleys. And we thank you that the glory of the Lord will be, will be revealed and all flesh shall sit together because the mouth of the Lord has declared it. In Jesus' name, go be fruitful. Enjoy the journey in Jesus' name. Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Good. Yeah. Let us not, let us not grow weary in well-doing. Well, you don't know what I have to face. I am so tired. Uh, here's what, 
it, the Bible says, be kind, tenderhearted one to another, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave us. Well, you don't know what they did to me. Whatever they do to you can't be what we did to Jesus. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. If you hold a grudge, it won't hurt the, whole, the person you're holding a grudge against. It'll hurt you. It'll sap the life out of you. And we need, to, we need to get open and honest, don't you think? Now, the message I'm going to speak today is one of the most encouraging uh, in, uh, promises that I've had from the Lord in a long time. Here's what he said. You ready? Tell my people, tell my people, tell my people, I'm getting ready to answer the prayer Paul prayed in the book of Colossians. Now, if you've got any sense at all, you'll go, what prayer did Paul pray in Colossians? And I'm going to show it to you, at 12. God said that if you meet the requirement, if you meet the requirement, you're going to get the promise of this prayer. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, I've, I've had fun. Don't go to church and not have fun. Yeah. You know, I don't mind causing a little stink. You know what I mean? I fly all the time, uh, all the time, go at getting on planes and all that kind of stuff. I was real sensitive one time. Every time these guys would close the overhead bins, they'd go, GD and Jesus Christ, cursing like that. And I mean, over and over and over and over. And so I said, I've had all this I'm going to put up with. We got 33,000 feet in there. They little ding before you can get up under your belt. So I got up and undid my belt. I opened the overhead bend and I'm fumbling around there acting like I'm really adjusting my backpack and I slammed that bend. You couldn't slam a bend any harder. Bam! And I go, damn Buddha. That's what I did. Damn Buddha. That's what I said. And I said to the whole praying load, I demand equal time. See, they cursed Jesus. They cursed God. Nobody was offended. I was. So listen, I mean, uh, that'll get you some space in a plane. You know what I mean? I mean, oh, oh, that, you, know. you need to have fun. Stir up some stuff. Listen, I'm telling you, when you walk into a place, the whole place ought to change. That's right. You're carrying the king of glory with you. It says, they looked at those, in, those early disciples and they understood they're ignorant, untrained, but they took notice of them. They'd been with Jesus. That's, that's, the, that's the catalyst, isn't it? I tell you, in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Okay, so let me talk to you a little bit about the books. Here's one, Dread Champions. God said, I want you to study the, the names and the, the titles of David's mighty men, and you'll find out the character and conduct I intend for my end-time army to have. And, boy, you need to read some of the great exploits these mighty men did, these fearless warriors. And I, I like what the Bible has to say. One of the things we need to do is start quoting the Bible about ourselves. This is Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiencies. See, it's not you, it's him working through you. I can do what? That's right. I'm writing a book about all things. It's pretty inclusive. Hey, hey, you look at now. You doing well? Okay, I gave you the last, I gave you one of these books. I intended for you to read it. Put it to work now, okay? And, I, and I'll tell you what, these mighty exploits these men did, that's available for us. Uh, we can do these mighty exploits also. The Bible, the Bible is really, really real. All right, the Spirit of God is calling forth the dread champions. This is not a time for the passive, non-committed Christianity. We are called and, in, and commissioned by Almighty God to become bold, passionate, powerful, end-time army, confronting compromise and raising the standard of purity ever higher. Don't you think? We're saying, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. I will be your God. You will be my sons and daughters, declares the Lord God Almighty. We have got to understand holiness is not optional. Pursue peace and holiness, for without holiness, no person will see the Lord. I love the Bible. It never asks a question without, without releasing an answer. Sociology raises a lot of questions, no answers. The Bible never raises a question without an answer. Example. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. 
And I'm telling you, God wants to answer every question you've got in the Word of God if you'll take time to study the Word of God is perfectly furnished, and He'll furnish you with everything you need to live godly in this present world. So get the book. Uh, is that a Packers shirt? I got to preach to the Green Bay Packers when they won the Super Bowl. Yes, I did. Good Lord. i never seen so many chicken breast and steak my whole life. A whole table full. Now, I got in there when they won the Super Bowl, uh, and, and I'll tell you what, uh, Reggie White, that's how I got in there. Uh, Reggie was a good friend. And uh, I'd punch him on the arm like this. Boom, boom. And I, I was just playing around with him. And uh, finally he threw his arm up. I looked like a woman. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, we were good friends. And so they let me get in there and preach to him when they'd won the, bring the, the uh, championship. And it was the craziest thing. These big old guys, they were like, like gorillas, man. And I said to them, what is your number one problem? And guess what they told me? Loneliness. I said, nobody wants us just for ourselves. They just want us for what we can do. And the police were out there at the hotel, locked arms, trying to keep the women off of them. And they said, loneliness is our problem. And boy, the power of God fell in there, and those old big boys would just uh, drape across us and weep and cry. I'm telling you guys, we need to shine and share, don't you think? And we need to be in, in season and out of season. Uh, do you, you, some, you believe sometimes God will alter the whole thing just to get you to share a message. Example, I was in uh, Paris, France, over there in Paris, France, and I'm flying out of the, uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport, and there, that's, that's my plane taking off. That's a 747. Up we go like this, and the thing makes a hard turn. That ain't right. Pilot comes on and says, well, I guess you noticed that uh, we're, going back to the, we're going back to the terminal. We've lost an engine. So they turn around and come back. Now, they didn't turn us all loose. They, they put us in a, a special area so we wouldn't be roving all over the airport. Several hundred of us off this big plane. And there they are, the seats are up like this. And everybody's mad because the plane's delayed and uh, had a problem. And I, I'm sitting on the front of that place. And I said, hey, God. How come you turn the plane around? He said, oh, so you could preach. I said, God, I don't feel like preaching. He said, you felt like preaching at the conference. And I said, okay. I get up now. They're all, guess, guess 90% of the passengers on the plane were uh, cosmetic surgeons. They had gone to Paris to learn the new tuck and ship and tie, you know, facial, you know. <laughs> woo! You know, put them lips on you, look like a, a platypus or whatever they do, you know. <laughs> Get you some eyebrows, look like fly swatters. Good Lord! You know, you know. <laughs> that, these, these, it, that's, that was, they had this big school over there, and that's mainly the people on the plane. They're mad. And I get up and, and I just start, I, I, I thought I was being kind of uh, quiet. And I thought I said, ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention? But uh, if you rewind the, rewind the footage, hey, I got something to tell you. You're headed for eternity. Where are you going to be when you get where you're going? I had their attention. See, there are, every one of us is on a destination. And we get to choose heaven or hell. Heaven or hell, the choice is up to you. If you got any sense at all, get off the road to hell and come to the road of heaven. Amen. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Few there be that find it. Because broad is the way that leads to hell. All you got to do to go to hell is stay like you're born. We're born in sin. In sin did my mother conceive me. The wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. Now I'm telling you guys. God said, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. Now, here we go. Some people go, well, you know, Bobby, this plan of salvation is so complicated and so difficult. Who are you? What? You know what the Bible says? The way of salvation is so simple that a wayfaring fool need not ear therein. I said, that's in the Bible. The way of salvation is so simple, a wayfaring fool need not ear therein. So I said, God, give me that in text again. Here it is. If you got enough sense to get back to your house, you got enough sense to get saved. That's what that verse means. It's simple. The way of salvation is so simple that a wayfaring fool. God didn't make it complicated. 
that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. All that come to him, he'll in no wise turn, turn away. He wants you saved. Look what he paid for you. He, he, we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as gold and silver, but with what? Precious blood of Christ. I dare you to try to look up the word precious. It's a word that means incalculable. So valuable you can't put a value on it. The blood that Jesus Christ shed for us. We're not redeemed. You know what one preacher said one time? I'll have nothing to do with that slaughterhouse religion. Well, without the shedding of blood, there remains no, no more sacrifice for our sin. Well, anyway, I'm supposed to be talking about some books now. <sighs> All right. Dread champions, you, you know about that. You're supposed to be a warrior. Well, I don't feel like no warrior. Well, you're backslid. The Bible says the righteous will be as bold as a lion. And the church is going, meow. What's wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong. The Bible said, the righteous will be as bold as a lion. Our timidity is testimony to our carnality. When we're in sin, we're weak. God wants us to be bold and brave, very courageous. Okay. He said, backslid, yeah. It says, the wicked's running, nobody's even chasing. But the righteous will be as bold as a lion. You say, well, Bobby, I don't know conflict. You in conflict. You know that, don't you? Uh, listen, our whole nation's in conflict. The problem in America right now is you cannot have Christianity and communism. And see, we're, we're in a dangerous spot in our nation right now. We're about this close to World War III. But it's up to us. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble my, themselves and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, God will hear from heaven. He'll forgive our sin. He'll heal our land. See, okay. Any. All right, let's see. Here's one, Master's Plan, Divine Design. Because I have so many people go, I don't know what God wants me to do. Find out. <laughs> and you find out in the scriptures. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know my thoughts I think towards you, declares the Lord. Thoughts of your success, not your failure. My intention is to bring you what? To a good end, good end not a dismal demise. How you doing? Yeah, you. You doing okay? Give me five. There you go. There you go. I tell you, I, I, I like the young. I, I like young people. Listen, I'll be 80 years old next month, and I get to speak in the largest youth conferences in the world. I go, why do they want to see a fat guy sweat? That's. <laughs> I'll tell you what they want to see: reality. Yes. They want to see: is this God real? Is this some kind of hoax, or is there really eternity? And boy, it's real. And I'm telling you. We have some amazing situations with those young people. They brought the extreme Olympics out there to California, you know, where they jump, off the, they jump up there in the motorcycles, jump off and jump back on, the extreme Olympics. And so uh, I was out there doing a, a conference, and they put me in the same hotel where the extreme Olympics were being held. So uh, here, we, here we go. I'm, I'm in the elevator with my little bitty Walmart briefcase, and I'm standing like this, and uh, I'm going up to my room, and all of a sudden, the door opens up, and it's the monster girls. You know the monster drink? Those with the claws like that? It's the monster girls that had just come back from a shoot making a, a commercial for that monster drink. They're not very clad at all. <laughs> and uh, there they are. They just burst into the elevator. I'm back up like this. I'm looking at the floor. And here's what one of them said. You ready? Hey, babe, what are you here for? You want to party? I said, don't I look like a party animal? Here's what I said to the monster girls. No, I'm not here to party. I'm here to tell people about Jesus Christ. One of the girls implodes. Ah! Ah, ah, I'm a Christian. I'm not supposed to be acting like this. And she said, I think there's a whole bunch more. I said, well, get them, bring them down there to the lobby. They had a big old pool and a, a spout. I said, we'll preach to them and baptize them. We get down there, oh, Lord. I got hallelujahs and F-bombs in the same message. Yeah. But we've got to share, hadn't we? We can't keep this inside the four walls of the church. It says Jesus went about doing good. We got to get out in the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. 
Uh, don't you think? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of. No, be bold. Be, let's, let's get a little more aggressive about soul winning, don't you think? Mm-hmm. The Bible said uh, there's a night coming when no man can work anymore. We better work while it's day, don't you think? Okay, uh, so get the books. I'll sign your books. Boy, boy, Heidi. We got one called Shepherd's Rod for 29 years on the Day of Atonement. We have a visitation from Jesus Christ. Let's stop and let me kind of slow that down. For 29 years on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, I have a visitation from Jesus Christ. He'll come tell me some of the things that's going to happen in the future, and I write in a book called Shepherd's Rod. This is one for 2023, and this is talking about, uh, oh, it's out of Daniel 7. Have you read Daniel 7, 21 and 22? It's pretty wild. It said the evil forces were ruling and raging until the Ancient of Days stands and renders a verdict in behalf of the saints of God, and the, saint, the time has arrived for the saints of God to possess the kingdom. Now, this, this one right here, angels came. They were massive, maybe 50 feet tall. Their wings sounded like Huey helicopters. The whole ground is vibrating, and they're screaming, sound alarm, divine urgency, etc., etc. And in this, I write about it, I get swallowed in a glory cloud. And my wife took a picture of it when it happened. I'm on the back, seat, back porch in Moravian Falls, North Carolina, in her home on the Day of Atonement. It, the sun was setting, and they were golden looking like spears being thrown out, out of the sunset like that. Whew! And I was watching it. It was cold. My wife had came out there and put a blanket around me and a cup of uh, tomato soup. And I'm watching these things. And all of a sudden, here comes a glory cloud and swallows me. And my wife took a picture of it. She thought she was just going to take a picture of me in the soup. But she gets the whole glory cloud there. And I'm inside a glory cloud and it's spinning around. All of this is true. I'm telling you, you need to understand the time has come. It said the evil forces, Daniel 7, 21 and 22. The evil forces were waging war against the saints of God and prevailing until. And boy, Heidi, we talk about this encounter we had with the Ancient of Days. Nearly killed me. Bob Jones heard it uh, live when I preached it. He said, that's the most powerful message I ever heard on earth. And I'm telling you, it's where I met the Ancient of Days. Oh, man. Uh, the Ancient of Days is God in his full, unfurled majesty. A flaming fire. Where he stood was like melted lava. And he said, you have to step where I step. You can't walk by, beside me. You can walk behind me. Fire shot out of my eyes, out of the follicles. On my... Listen, you'll, you'll read about it. But it's really real. I, I vow to you, this is real. And the... the it's, we've already had shepherd's rod for 2024. And the Lord said, it's the sequel to this one. What he told me to do in this one gives implementation for it in the next one. Oh, man. We need to really be. He, he said, here's what the angels are screaming. Divine urgency. Sound the alarm. Awake the warriors. Mobilize the body of Christ. Do we have any military people in here? The word mobilize is a military term. It's getting the troops to the most advantageous place to engage the enemy and win. We got to mobilize the body of Christ. We got to get out on the front line. We, he, the Bible calls us sons, saints, and what? Soldiers. The, there's a war on, isn't there? A spiritual war. And we've got to take a stand. The devil's defeated. He just doesn't want you to know he is. The Bible said, Behold, observe, look, I give you power to trample. On serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And it'll in no wise hurt you. So the devil's more afraid of you than you are him. Behold, observe, I give you power to trample. Have you, have you read uh, Romans 16.20? Romans 16.20 said the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. That's why the devil doesn't want you to have peace. I would do Isaiah 26.3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. Trust in the Lord Jehovah for him. The Lord Jehovah is what? Everlasting, never failing strength. And he'll, he'll fortify you for the task, won't he? Now, some of the greatest warriors I've ever met are women. Yeah. Look out now. That's true. Here's one, and I'm kind of ashamed to tell this story. I was off down in Belize. There's an old missionary down there. And she's little and pretty uh, swiveled up. And uh, uh, back then... There in Belize, the Rastafarians hated anybody that was white. 
uh, because what Britain and the British did to him. But anyway, I'm down there with the old missionary. We're out doing uh, uh, ministry in, in the jungles there in Belize, having a good time. And she's driving. A little, you know, she's up there. She's swiveled up and she's driving like this. And uh, the, there was a detour on the road where we had to turn down kind of an alley. And oh my goodness, there is a whole nest of Rastafarians. Now, you can understand what they're talking. They're, they're cussing every breath. They're going to roll this car over and yeah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And it's getting bad. They're shaking the car, and there's a whole ton of them. I'm looking under the seat looking for a lug wrench or a tar tool. <laughs> that, honest to God, I'm fixing to knock the curls out of them Jerry curls, you know. <laughs> and guess what happened? This is the sad part. The little missionary looked over at me like this and said, mm, I suspect prayer will work better. <laughs> I go, why didn't I think of that? The wrath of man works not the will of God. And the little missionary started praying in tongues. Those guys go nuts. Ah! Boom. Nobody got bloody knuckles or nothing. And I thought, why didn't I think of that? But she looked over there and she said with the sweetest look, like a little bird, I said, prayer, I suspect prayer will work better. <laughs> Some things are obvious, you know, you know. <laughs> but anyway, they took off running. It was just wild. What I'm trying to tell you, God will get you into certain situations and circumstances where he'll direct you, and it'll look like it's going to be catastrophic, but it'll work out great. You understand? God, God, God wants to make your way clear and, and, straight, and straight, and he, he does. I was qu quoted that prayer when we were praying for y'all. It says uh, that the Lord in the mountains filled in the valleys, said, make crooked ways straight, said the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway, Lord of the mountains fill in the valleys, and it says the glory of God will be revealed. And all flesh shall sit together because the mouth of the Lord has declared it. God wants to lower the valleys. Make straight ways, don't you think? Listen, it's going to be okay. Do you know that? You don't know it yet, but it's going to be okay. He can unravel our mess. All right? That's right. We can't, but he can. The Lord can unravel it. I've been in some deep stuff, man. Whew. Uh, Listen, uh, the devil wants to wreck our lives, doesn't he? And I'm telling you, God wants to redeem our lives. And we've got to turn to the Lord. Now, I'm telling you, there's a way that seems right. Run to the Lord. And I don't care how deep a pit. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is, I waited patiently upon the Lord. He inclined unto me. He heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a solid rock. He established my goings. He put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and trust the Lord. Now, here's what they said about me when I was growing up. He'll be dead or in the penitentiary time. He's 21. So I tried to live down to their expectation. And I was in and out of jail. Listen. Crazy stuff, crazy. The devil wants to kill you. Uh, yeah, my, my dad was dead, and my mother couldn't control us. I had my brother. He's bigger than me, and my, brother's, my mother was little. She'd try to correct us. We'd pick her up and chunk her back and forth between us. She'd kick and scream, you know, and set her down, <laughs> let her have her fit, you know. Yeah. yeah, we grew up really without any restraint. That's a bad thing to do because, uh, listen, the devil wants to drive you away from God. But the Spirit of God wants to draw you to God. And so anyway, God's got a plan, hasn't he? A good plan, not a bad one. And I, I want us to just say, God, what is your will for my life? And listen to him. He'll tell you. God's already, he said, every day of your life is written in his book. That's what it says, Psalms 139. All of our days are written in his book before we've ever lived a single one of them. So I suspect if we're going to be successful, we should let his journal become our journey. All of our days are written in his book before we've ever lived a single one of them. Psalms 139, verse 15, 16, and 17. So you study, it's in there. All of our days. See, somewhere back there in eternity past, God picked up his pen and wrote that you'd be in World Harvest Church today. That's what he says. All of our days are written in his book before we've ever lived a single one of them. 
See, God's got a, your life planned out if you'll follow him. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells it's a good plan, not a bad one. Don't you believe that? Well, there's the doc. You doing all right? Yeah. Good. I oh, mean, did I tell you when I got my tongue cut off? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> playing football, playing football, Friday night football in Texas. And here we go. There's a guy. Yeah. Tackle a guy. And, a, and just like that, my chin, his heel hit my chin. And just like that, my whole mouth felt like it was full of jello. I ran to the bench to the coach, and it had severed my tongue off. And the, the coach, I can't say in church exactly what he said, but something like, Shucks! <laughs> I got to get you to the doctor. We take off on Friday night to go down to the doctor, Dr. H.H. H. Rahm. And I, 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 my tongue is cut off. And the H.H. H. Rahm, the doctor said, well, I got good news and I got bad news. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. What is that? He said, I can sew your tongue back on, but I can't deaden it. Because you'll swallow it and uh, whatever you do, choke yourself to death. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen the needle they sew your tongue on with? I have. It's crooked. And it makes a sound. When it goes up, when it goes down. And t- between the, there's, they tie a knot in it. Now, I'll, or to translate that, it means I'm going to knock you out when I get out of this chair. Sewed my whole tongue, tongue back on. Friday night, sewed my tongue back on. Then H.H. H. Rom said, oh, I got real bad news now. Yeah, yeah. He said, it's going to hurt worse when I take them out. I said to him, I'll paraphrase that. I'll tell you one thing, big boy. You ain't taking them out. I took them out myself. How'd you do it? Here's how I did it. I self-medicated. That's how I did it. Then I bit the knot off later and pulled them off. It works. I get paid to talk. <laughs> See? And then I cut myself wide on. Remember? My uncle had a saw like he cut down a tree and he put it in a vise and he sharpened it there and left it. I'm at my grandmother's house. My mama's off to get my blind cousin. She's blind because her mama shot her with a 38 caliber pistol through the head. Yeah. Here we go. You think you've had a tough life? Hey, well, here we go. So I'm at my granny's house, and I'm a big old bully boy, and I was going to be Tarzan. I was going to run, jump on the table, and swing on this limb, and, do, and so I ran, and I jumped and grabbed the limb and swung. The limb broke, and I fell full throttle on the saw in this vise. Cut myself wide open. All my guts fell out. Every gut fell out. Man, I was beside myself. Hey! There's my guts. I mean, in Granny's backyard, there's chicken poop, there's chicken feathers, there's limbs and leaves. My grandpa, he's not a medic. He, he, met, he plowed an old mule named Shorty. So he runs out there. There's my pile of guts. I mean, from here, it just cut all the way. There they are. Now, he doesn't pick it up and say, this looks like a liver. It could be a kidney. He just picks the whole mess up and pulls the flap up. Picks me up, carries me into the kitchen. Lays me down. That's when they cured meat with salt. Yeah, he walks over there and gets a big old scoop of salt, pulls the flap up, and throws a big, yeah, say invigorating. (laughs) Woo! Poured salt in there, and it's about to get worse. They cook with kerosene. He gets a coffee can, goes over there, pulls up a can full of kerosene, comes back to the victim, pulls it, and... (laughs) Throws in the kerosene. Thank God. Then I passed out. The ceiling turned purple and (laughs) fell in on me. And so they tied me together to let me drain. And then the next time I'm awakened, a day and a half later, the doctor's in the door. This is Dr. Henderson and my mother. And the Dr. Henderson is going, that ain't a good word. That's what he said. We're not going to sew him up. We're just going to leave him tied together and let him drain. We don't think he's going to make it. But I made it. No suturing. Not a one single suture. 
I gave that story in California, and a guy was waving his hand back there. Looked like he's trying to stop a bus in New York. I said, you want to say something? He said, yes, I do, brother. I'm a leading gastrologist. I want to examine you. I said, well, come on, knock yourself out. So we got up there. I didn't want to pull my shirt off and look like Free Willy, you know. So <laughs> I got up there and got behind the curtain. And this leading gastrologist surgeon from California, he examined me. There's scars all, all the way here. And he goes nuts. Oh, oh, oh. You've got to come to my office. I said, why? He said, I've got to document this. I said, I don't need no documentation. I was there. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he said, you, you have to have these sutured or they'll herniate. No. I mean, listen, that's, that's pretty. See, I grew up rough. Blew my brother up. Ex yeah. Hit my brother in the head with a hammer and stuck the hammer in his head. What? My brother Glenn could whip me with his fist, but I had a hammer. That's a song. <laughs> he wheeled me around to smack me one, and I had the hammer, and I went, wham. You got a hole in your head. It's right there. That's where the hammer handle hit. The head of the hammer hit right there and stuck in his head. The handle sticking out like that. And here's what the doctor said. It's a miracle. Said if you'd hit him there, you'd have killed him. If you hit him there, you'd have killed him. You hit him in the only place. So you got a hole in your head, the sinuses, and that's where the hammerhead went. Yeah, so the, you know, from that time on, he had a little half moon just to remind him that, you know. <laughs> I've shot him, knifed him, hit him in the head with the hammer, blew him up once. Yeah, that's how we grew up. Yeah, my mother got my drunk uncle to come down to whip us one day. And I ain't going to take no whooping out of my drunk uncle. So I knocked him out. And his, his false teeth went ran under the couch. And my dear mother's there. Her knocked her brother out. And he, she's trying to drag his teeth out with a mop handle. <laughs> my life has been kind of chaotic. You know what I mean? But uh, I, I'm having a good time. When I first started preaching, the first few rows would be policemen. That's true. I spent a lot of time, you know. Yeah. <laughs> What are you doing, boy? Nothing, you know. Yeah, just hanging out, you know. Yeah. Oh, boy. The judge that used to lock me up bought me my first preaching suit. He came to me and said his name was Judge Winston Reagan. He said, Preacher, you know why I bought you that suit? And I said, no, sir. He said, I'm a Methodist, and Methodists don't talk like this. He said, a voice came to me and told me to buy you that suit. See? God will make a way for you. But I, if, listen, here's what I'm trying to tell you. If God will use me, all of us have a shot. You know what I mean? You know, you, a lot of times you think, well, they were born with the Bible in one hand and a spoon in the other. No, listen, we grew up really, really rough. But uh, had a, I, I enjoy living, don't you? I don't like to get around sours. Yeah. Well, you won't have to be around them long. A merry heart does good like a medicine. You dry up like that, you, you're hurting your own self. A merry heart does good like a medicine. The joy of the Lord's our strength. So be happy. Okay? Well, I don't have a good internet. Well, thank God. You know. <laughs> Some of that mess ain't worth, worth watching, is it? No. But we get... Okay, I better get into this. Okay, ducky. I know y'all thought I'd forgot, but I got a mind like a seal trap. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I was famous in our school for I, well, all the wrong reasons. <laughs> Blew up the lab. I told you all about that. Turned a chick, truckload of chickens loose in there. Oh, it's awful. Here's what happened. I was arrested the night that they graduated. I was incarcerated. So they sent me my yearbook. You know, when you graduate, you, I, I graduated. And here's what the teacher wrote in my yearbook. You ready? Here it is. It's your fault. I had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> That's what she said. Do you believe somehow God just has a way to paying you back? So I started pastoring after I got saved. Started pastoring First Baptist Church in Bullard, Texas. And we, everything was going really smooth. But when I was in school, they was miss, uh, uh, we, we had a, a, a little lady there. And um, she was, uh, had a little mini Cooper kind of car. And she'd try to leave, and I could hold it back, and it would choke the motor out. And so she was always just kind of fussy. 
So me and the football boys came and picked her car up and carried it down in the football field one time and put it down in the football. They had to tear a rock wall out to get her car out. Yeah. Her name was Miss Martin. And so I'm preaching there at the First Baptist Church. They're astounding pastor. And the little lady comes and brings me the visitor's card. Pastor, we have a new family with us, the Martins. <laughs> this is years after I graduated. And, uh, I, go, no. and I looked across there, and there was her son. There was a, and there was Miss Martin. The same Miss Martin that we picked her car up and carried it down there. The same Miss Martin that we, uh, we harassed. I said, uh, <clears throat> Miss Martin, <laughs> is that you? She stands up. She's older than dirt. Yes, it sure is. And I remember everything you did. Yes, it. Sounded like a little feist dog. Just chewed me out from in my own church. But it was fun. She moved in the community. See, so, listen, your life just kind of follows you. Miss Martin. And the little car was so weak. And we, it was, we come up with some things, man. Television affected me some. Oh, you'd see these westerns where they'd pour a cag of dynamite out. Yeah. And then they'd light the fuse. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to try that. <laughs> so we got, we got a 55-gallon drum of diesel. It's a mixture of gas where they make diesel and gas together. And Opelike plant was there. So you could, it was just a sign, come steal from me or something like that. And <laughs> we, we got a whole 55-gallon drum. We took, I put it in my truck, took the baffle loose and drove down through Main Street, Brownsboro, the only street in Brownsboro, and got all the way down there. And so in TV, you light this thing, it goes, Sloof! but in Brownsboro, it goes, boom! <laughs> it looked like you had set a bomb off, blew every, every window out of the stores. Uh, the fumes, the fumes ignited. A big old yellow ball went up. <laughs> then some red lights came. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> get the drum out of your truck. You know what? If you've blown up the town, get the drum out of your truck, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's how I grew up. Just kind of, I, I don't think I was, well, I was just wild in a buck. For example, I was laying on the couch one night. This is when President Kennedy got shot. I was laying on the couch one night. And I, my, my mom had the television on, and it showed a, a, a little guy riding a burrow across the mm -hmm. desert. And I, it hit me. I said, my God, I'm going to Mexico. So I jumped up, grabbed a paper sack, wrote my mom a note, gone to Mexico, threw the sack down the middle of the floor, went up and, well, robbed a place, got some bus money, <laughs> took off to Mexico. <laughs> there I am. I was down there when Kennedy got shot. My mama thought I had something to do with that. <laughs> That's the truth now. Don't lie in church. Whew, I'm down there. Just a kid, crazy man, down in the bad drug part of uh, Mexico. Lease me a buggy down there that you can lease a buggy. You know, I don't speak Spanish. I know taco and I know chihuahua and stuff like that. But anyway, I'm down there and I lease this buggy that a horse drawn buggy and the guy you know I, I, I'm just out trying to have a fun and I thought two's a crowd so I, I knocked, knocked the driver off of the buggy wham he falls in the ditch I didn't know the horse is trained to go back to where you got him back we go yeah I was in a big mess you ever been in a big mess there was more federal rallies there than you could count I ended up in jail it's pretty rough. But see, the way of the transgressor is hard. I'm living proof. That's right. The way I got a hole in my head. You can stick your finger in it right there. The cop hit me in the head. Yeah, split my skull. But the Bible said the way of the transgressor is what? Hard. It's not easy. I'm telling you. So anyway, uh, that's how I grew up. But And people still go, wow, I can't believe it's you. You know, I, I got to go back to my school and preach. Uh, for uh, the 45 year class thing so I, I sure wasn't a preacher when I was in school but anyway I get there and there's all the class good God I thought I was at a nursing home 
The Holy Ghost will keep you invigorated, strengthened. I got there, and good Lord. Most of them, they put all the dead people's picture up on the wall. Here's what I said. I said, look, most of our friends are not with us tonight. Wonder where they're at. So it cut it down, either heaven or hell. So I got, that's how I started the message. Well, I was going to preach tonight, today, but uh, I better start, I guess. Okay. Here's what the Bible, here's what the Lord told me. He said, Bobby. I said, yes. He said, tell my people. I'm preparing to answer the prayer Paul prayed in Colossians chapter 1. So please take your time and turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to read this. You ready? Colossians chapter 1. And let's start with verse 8. Paul had planted some churches and one was in Colossae here. And he had sent out some of his workers to check on how the missions were going. And one, one man, he comes, I'll read it here. Also, uh, he said, uh, verse 7 says, So he learned it from Epaphroditus, our beloved fellow worker. He came back and he began to give a report concerning one of the churches. Now, here's what the Lord told him. He said, Bobby, I am preparing to answer this prayer that Paul prayed for anybody that meets the requirement. And here's the requirement. Verse 8, he, Epaphroditus, he also informed us of your love in the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a real weak, he, here's what it literally says. He told me of your burning, zealous love for the Holy Spirit. That's, the, that's what we got to meet. we got to have a burning, zealous love for the Holy Spirit. If we have that, here's where we start with verse 9. For this reason, our burning, zealous love, we also, from the day we heard of it, your burning, zealous love, have not ceased to pray. Make special requests for you, asking that you may be what? Filled with the full, deep, clear knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and comprehensive insights into the ways and the purposes of God and in understanding and discerning of spiritual things. How many of you want that? I do. He said, I'm going to answer that prayer. Look at that again. For this reason, we also, from the day we heard of it, that you may be filled with the full, deep, clear knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and comprehensive insights into the ways and the purposes of God. Verse 10, that you may walk, live, and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing to him and desiring to please him in all things. Bearing fruit in every good work. Steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of God. With fuller, deeper, clearer insights and acquaintances and recognition. Verse 11. And we pray that you may be what? Invigorated. Invigorated. And strengthened with all power according to the, the might of his glory. To exercise every kind of endurance and patience and perseverance and forbearance with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. And made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints. God's holy people in light. I'm telling you. He said if we will be burning zealous in love with the Holy Spirit. He's going to answer this prayer for us. I want it don't you? I want to know a deeper, fuller, clearer insights into the wisdom and the ways of God. So the Lord wouldn't lie to me. He said, if you get my people to be zealously burning in love with the Holy Spirit, I'll answer that prayer for him. Wow. That you may walk and live and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. I want that, don't you? And I'm telling you, it's available to us or God would have never told me that. Aren't you glad? See, God won't lie. It's impossible for him to lie. Okay? Say, I want it. What, what is the prerequisite? Burning, zealous love for the Holy Spirit. I mean, not, not just, well, you know. No, I mean just craving, hungry, desiring to please the Holy Spirit and everything. We can't do a single thing without the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4.13 said, I can do all things through Christ who infuses me. And that without the Holy Spirit, we can't do a single thing. But with him, through him, by him, we're unstoppable. Yeah. Is that correct? This means yes. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you doing okay? It's going to get better. Yeah. That's true. We go from glory to glory, don't we? And I'll I tell you what we need to do. We need to start declaring what we want God to do for us. The Bible said we have not because we ask not. The Bible says, seek and you shall find, knock, it'll be open for you. Here's your great verse. You ready? Make up your mind what you want. Tell God what that is and he'll get it for you. 
That's in the Bible. Make up your mind what you want. Tell God what that is and he'll get it for you. Job 22, 28. Here's what the Bible says. And you shall decide a thing. Make up your mind. Then you decree what you've decided. You tell God what it is. And it says the light of his favor will shine upon your path when you'll get what you're asking. So we've got to make up our mind what we want. What do you want? I don't know. Yeah. We have not because we ask not. And so Job 22, 28. You shall decide a thing, then you decree what you decide, and the Lord will establish it, and the light of his favor will shine upon your pathway. Well, we've got to go in a moment. i got a plane to catch tonight. Oh, Lord, we're going somewhere. But that'll be fun. I won't have to, you know. Well, we've had some opportunities on the plane. Yeah. I got on a plane once. I, I, I do things uh, random. I was down in the very tip of Texas riding with a pastor. And they got, the, they got these orchards down there. And they spray them with these funny looking planes. Got two wings on them. They, vroom! And so we're down there in the orchards. Vroom! This dust, this uh, plane that sprays the orchards came over. Vroom! And I said, you know, I'd like to ride in one of those. And the pastor said, really? Yeah. So the plane lands out in the field. Pastor turns on the blinker, turns in. We get out there, and there's a guy that owns a plane, and uh, they're putting some uh, spray in it and some fuel. And so the pastor says, uh, here's a visiting evangelist. He said, uh, he wants to ride in the plane. And the guy said, you want to ride in the plane? Yeah. It's got two wings on it. So, okay, they fill up the plane. They said, get in. I got in. And the seat looked like an old Walmart boat seat. And it no, no cockpit, so you, you're back there. And the, you buckle the belt. And we got in there. And we take off. And the pilot's up there. I have not met him yet. And we take off like that. And I get to look down. And boy, you can, it was beautiful. You could see all. It looked like uh, landscaping. But it was uh, the foliage. They planted it in a pretty way. We're way up there high. And the plane's loud. And uh, they has got one little stick behind it. It looked like an emergency brake on an old shooter baker. And here's what happened. You need to be evangelistic. So I leaned up to the pilot. And I go, hey, do you know Jesus? What? Are you a Christian? What? Do you know Jesus? Oh, when he heard Jesus the third time, he manifested. You've never seen blown out demonic any worse than this. You, he unfurls. He turned the whole sky black with curses. And jerked the plane. Now I'm not an aeronautical guy. The plane goes. <laughs> and here we go down. <laughs> hey. They say you know your life passes. No it don't. We're going down like this and the plane's spinning like this. And here's what I thought. They won't be enough of me to bury when this thing hits. <laughs> going down like this. That guy is bloody, just crazy. Plane spinning like that. And I said, God. And somehow this thing pulls up and he lands. I fell out of the back of that plane. And I thought, let him go to hell. That's what I thought. <laughs> but, but that's not very Christian-like. So I said, what's the deal? And here's what the deal was. You ready? He went off to fight for our freedom in the war. And one of the Baptist preachers ran off with his wife. While he's over there fighting for our freedom. So he comes back and he's hostile and hard and hateful towards God. But uh, God can get us over that. You understand that? There's nothing befalling us that the blood of Jesus can't cleanse. But I thought for a moment, I thought, whoo. Listen. But who's going to just get in a plane with somebody they've never met? You know, me? I, you're, can I tell you about my motorcycle ride? Yeah! They got that, down in Texas, they got a hamburger called Belt Buster, and it works. So I'd, I'd pulled in there to get me a hamburger, and I was going to preach, and I had a nicer clothes on, and I was going to preach. And so I didn't want to uh, go through the drive-in, so I get out to go in there. And here comes a chopper motorcycle, whoom, right there. And uh, uh, I said, man, that's a nice-looking bike. It was, it was a rough-looking bike. 
And so I had a little track about I asked because of care. So I gave him this track. I said, here, read this. And I go in and come back out with my belt buster, and there the guy is. He said, uh, you want to talk to me about this piece of paper? I said, yeah, yeah, I will. He said, you like bikes? I said, I do. He said, get on. <laughs> That's me throwing my leg over a Harley. <laughs> he fired it up. And we take out of the Dairy Queen down Par- Prairieville Street in Athens. <laughs> Get down to the first light. He throws it on its side and does a donut. I've laid hands on him. <laughs> His black hair is all over my face. <laughs> He's got a tattoo here. Go to hell and how to get there. And I'm telling you, he does a donut and comes back to the, the place where I left the car. And he said, uh, you got time to talk to me? I, 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 <laughs> Here's what he said. He said, My, I'm a leader of a motorcycle gang. He said, we broke into a barn out here at the airport. Would you come and speak to my people? I'm, I'm supposed to go to a big church and preach. And I go out there to this barn. They, they pull the door open, and it looked like uh, something you see in a, it, it's like rats in the hay, men and women and men, men, and it's crazy. And they'd stolen a jute box at that time. He walks over there, and he kicks, it, kicks the plug out of the wall, and the music quits, and here's this motorcycle gang. And I tell them the simple story about for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. These guys and gals came forward getting born again. The leader got born again and ended up running a big youth youth group out of Houston, Texas. But see, uh, there these big old boys would come and they'd fall on you and cry. And it was going so good till here comes the little gal about like that. And she gets right here in front of me. She clears her throat and spits right in my face. (laughs) Just like that. And I thought, I'll slap her into Wednesday. And, and the Lord said, no, that's not right. You know, said, she just, she's wounded and hurt. But see, you get, you don't, you know, a motorcycle gang's not going to come to your church. They're going to lay up in a bed doing all this other mess. We got to go out, don't you think? Now, I'm not saying you got to get on the back of a motorcycle unless you got to. Yeah, first time my wife ever saw me, I was riding an Indian motorcycle down the snow-covered road, shaved all the hair off my head with a razor, and put Vaseline on it. Yeah, irresistible, boy. <laughs> she did fall wildly in love with me, you know. That Indian motorcycle would be worth a ton of money. Yeah. I had, but here's what I want to tell you. Enjoy living. You want to? Listen. We've seen dead people raised. Anything Jesus did then, he'll do now. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord, I change not. Forever, O God, thy word is settled in heaven. It doesn't have to be revised. I mean, you can jump right in to a move of God. You ready? I think so. And how are we going to do it? We yield ourselves to the Lord. I'm not my own, I'm yours. I'm a love slave. You ought to read the book of, of Jude. shouldn't take long, just one page. <laughs> Jude's a pretty strong book, isn't it? He said certain men are preppy and teaching that it doesn't matter what you believe. It does matter what you believe. How old are you? Ten. I'll be 80 pretty soon, but, you know, I'm kind of young at heart, <laughs> kind of childish in a few ways, but Jesus really loves you. Do you know what? He really does. You know what the Bible says? Well, I'll tell you. It says, except we become as a little child, we can't see or enter the kingdom. I suspect we're going to have to digress to advance, don't you think? One of the greatest problems to getting you full of the Holy Spirit is your mind. Because the natural mind receives not the things of the Spirit. It's foolishness to you. Neither can you know it. It must be spiritually discerned. So I don't care how bright you are. The simplest phrase from God is so profound, you can't get it naturally. It has to be ingested by the Spirit of God. Well, I had fun. Don't come to church and not have fun. We're going we're gonna to pray for people. I'm going to pray that every cancerous growth disappears. Every cancerous growth, some that have not even been found, the, when the doctors go, well, I'm so sorry. No, God says no cancer is going to survive you, okay? I'm, I'm serious now. And God's going to heal blood disorder. 
I don't care if you've got bad liver. God said, I'm healing blood disorder. He said, I'm declaring your bones will wax fat. That's what he said. I'm going to bring a healing to the blood, and it's going to deal with the bones. He said, the bones will wax fat. You can figure out what that is. But it'll change the power of the blood. And we need fresh blood, don't we? I mean, we need to be healthy. And so anyway, God's a healer, isn't he? Yes. To be quite frank, none of us can heal without him. But in him, he, he wants people healed. We, we've watched him get healed. Here's what happened to me the other day. I said, God's here, and he's taking metal out of people's body. This guy runs up and stuck his arm out like this, and it looked like mercury dripping out of his arm right there, splashing on the floor. I said, what happened? He said, I, 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 I crushed my arm in a motorcycle wreck. They put bars and, and, and pins in here, and they melted and ran out on the floor. I watched him. looked like mercury when it was splat on the ground. See? And God took it all out. Got x-rays, no, no bone, no uh, bones are perfect. See? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We better get out here, hadn't we? Muchas gracias, señor. Yeah. I took drama in school because all the girls were in drama. <laughs> Miss Ellis, she goes, well, anyway. I said, that's not drama. I got up there 40-something feet in the air, packed the curtains, and jumped off like a parachute. Now, that was drama. <laughs> I landed on there and frisked across there. I looked like, man, it, yeah, yeah. Jumped off a 40-something foot ladder with the curtains wrapped up like a parachute. Have you ever done something that worked better than you thought? I went whirling out across there and landed on the platform and frisked across there. If I'd had a spandex, I'd have been like, you know. But that's, that's what happened in school. It's still famous, but uh, it's a miracle I made it. <laughs> See? Do something so you'll have some stories to tell your grandkids. Don't get on a 45-foot ladder, you know. But, you know, sometimes you just have to do what you got to do. What's your name? Daniel? That's in the Bible. What do you do, Daniel? Hmm? Yeah, listen, I'll tell you what. God's got a plan. You believe it? I, I want you to say, Lord, show me your plan. And he will. Show me your plan. Pull back the curtain and let me see. And he's got a person. Every plan is different. It's not a cookie cutter thing. Every person in this room is unique. Not a single one of us alike. And God moves in different ways. But he does move, doesn't he? Well, would you do this? The number one question I get asked is, how did you memorize the Bible? I studied it till all of my fingers wore holes in the pages. So I'm going to release something on you. I'm going to release retention that you'll be able to remember what you read. It says, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. You want it? Yes. Lord Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, we command right now, give these people a clear mind. You didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a sound mind, a mind that can catalog and retain, retain facts. And Lord, I pray, especially as they study the Word of God, they'll be able to hide it in their heart and pull it back up when they need it. We'll walk by the light of the Word of God. Thank you that your Bible says your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Bless the people now. Surround us with the loving care of God and help us to be bold and brave and very courageous and shine and shout about the wonderful redemptive love of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.